together with my colleagues in the Supreme Military Council and the Armed Forces, we have therefore resolved that we must now press on with all our might to defeat the rebels militarily and remove all traces of the tyranny and terror, the rebel regime, from the face of this country. Over at the Federal Army Headquarters in Lagos, the Chief of Army Staff, Brigadier Asant Kasina, and the Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces were putting finishing touches on the plans for the final blow of the Biafran Rebellion. In May 1969, Gowon replaced the competent Colonel Mohamed Shua with Colonel Bisala as commander of the Nigerian 1st Division. Colonel Murtala Mohamed is replaced with Colonel Gibson Jalo as commander of the Nigerian 2nd Division. The commander of the Nigerian 3rd Marine Commando Division, Colonel Benjamin Adekule, the Black Scorpion, is replaced by Colonel Ulushegu Obasanjo. With great rejuvenation, the Nigerian army was now on its way to crush the Biafran Rebellion forever. That same month, a Swedish national by the name of Carl Gustav von Rosen took it upon himself to re-establish the Biafran Air Force almost single-handedly. He led several Biafran airstrikes against some notable federal targets. This function, codenamed Operation Biafran Babies, saw von Rosen and his compatriots performing improvised squadron attacks against installations and airfields in Port Harcourt, Benin, and Enugu. The Nigerians were severely rattled by the attack, which led to the destruction of several of their Russian built aircraft and various oil and power installations in the Midwest. These attacks continued in the autumn but inevitably became unsuccessful in neutralizing the ability of the Nigerian Air Force to operate. The recapture of Oweri by the Biafran forces was quickly followed by a deep southward thrust towards Patakot. The Biafrans continued to occupy the countryside between and behind the federal positions. Colonel Obasanjo spent his initial six weeks of his command containing a Biafran advance at Haba. Initially, his objective was first to retake Oweri and then proceed to take Obuta before finally moving towards the all-important Uli airport, which was the safe haven of the Biafran resistance. However, by November 1969, the Nigerian reconnaissance probe had begun to reveal gaps in the Biafran defenses. This convinced Colonel Obansonjo that a better option would be to mount an advance on a broad front towards Umwaya to link up with the 1st Division, effectively cutting what remained of Biafra in half, before then turning west and advancing on Uli, by which point it could safely be surmised that the Biafran resistance would crumble. On the 22nd of December 1969, the 3rd Marine Commando Division attempted to link up with the 1st Division in Umwaya. They reached the city on Christmas Day, resulting in the dissection of the all-important food-producing region of Arochuku in the east. Without pausing to break their stride, Colonel Obasanjo and his men moved west towards Uli. The final battle between Nigeria and Biafra was about to take place. On the 7th of January 1970, Colonel Obasanjo's 3rd Marine Commando Division, supported by the 1st and the 2nd Divisions, launched the final offensive codename Operation Tailwind against the remaining Biafran enclave. In less than a day of fighting, the Biafrans were forced to surrender. While the Nigerian attacks continued, the Biafran leaders were having their final meeting. General Ojuku announced his plans of traveling abroad in search of peace and handed over the Biafran presidency to his vice president, Philip F. Young. On the 9th of January 1970, Ojuku boarded a private jet and fled to the Ivory Coast. Two days later, the Nigerians took control of Arochuku and the Uli airport. And so, the final enclave of Biafra, the land of the rising sun, had been successfully captured. The next day, the new Biafran president and his prominent officers called for a ceasefire and made their way to Oweri to broadcast their final surrender to Colonel Obasanjo. After a few moments of cordial conversation, Colonel Obasanjo accepted the offer for a surrender from the Biafrans. On the 15th of January 1970, Young flew to Lagos to officially announce the surrender and the Republic of Biafra ceased to exist. Bye. Major General Philip S. Young, officer administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, 
now wish to make the following declaration. That we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept that the Republic of Biafra hereby ceases to exist. The tragic chapter of violence is just ended. We are at the dawn of national reconciliation. Once again, we have an opportunity to build a new nation. You will have heard that my government may seek the assistance of friendly foreign governments and bodies, especially in the provision of equipment to supplement our national effort. There are, however, a number of foreign governments and organizations whose so-called assistance will not be welcome. These are the governments and organizations which sustained the rebellion. They are thus guilty of the blood of thousands who perished because of the prolongation of the futile rebel, rebel uh, resistance. They did not act out of love for humanity. Their purpose was to disintegrate Nigeria and Africa and impose their will on us. The Nigerian Civil War resulted in an upwards of over 100,000 military casualties and anywhere between 1 to 2 million Biafran civilians who died in one way or another as a consequence of the war. The later figure varies widely, but what is inescapable is that a colossal price of human life and suffering was paid in pursuit of national unity that remains as ill-defined today as it was then. Despite the rapid reintegration of the country and the concerted efforts on the part of Nigerians to put the past behind them, the question of unity would continue to plague the Nigerian political rhetoric as the years proceed. These tensions were overshadowed by the fact that the military remained in power after the war. Committed to unity and order, the military government was by no means democratic, becoming corrupt in every bit as the First Republic had been. As Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces, General Yakubu Gowon went on to rule Nigeria for another five years, becoming the longest-serving head of state and ruling the country for almost nine years until he was overthrown by the former commanding officer of the 2nd Division, Brigadier Morotala Mohamed. After 13 years in exile, Ujuku was pardoned by the then Nigerian president, Sheikh Mushagari, and allowed to return to the country as a private citizen. He continued to take part in active politics until the 26th of November 2011, when he died of a brief illness in the United Kingdom at the age of 78. He was accorded the highest military accolade by the Nigerian army during his funeral. It is now over 50 years after the war, but the question of Nigerian unity still hangs in the balance. Watch this video to the end. I want to say thank you and you are amazing. If you love my work and want to support it, enabling me to continuously tell the story of Africa clearly and concisely. There are also rewards and special offers exclusive to our patrons. And do not forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification to never miss any of our videos when it drops. You can also watch the entire Nigerian history playlist at the end of the video. I will leave you with some before and after photos of some of the kingpins during the war. I love you all and until I see you in the next video, goodbye.